Hey everyone, it's Mike here from The Art of Guitar. I'm here today with a brand new series that I'm really excited about. I thought about it last night when I was trying to go to bed and I couldn't. So I made the mistake of picking up my phone. I was looking through it, which you shouldn't do when you're trying to go to sleep. But I was on this Facebook cover band page and all of a sudden I saw this video from this band. I don't know who they are. It just randomly popped up. And it gave me all these weird nostalgic emotions for some reason. I think a big part of it is that they're playing like at a dive bar and they're kind of struggling. And I thought, you know what, back in the day that used to happen to me all the time. But I didn't know how to fix anything because I was just brand new at it and I was just happy to be in a band playing live. So I had no way to offer any suggestions or even help myself to improve because I didn't really know what needed improving at the time. But because now I've been playing live for over three decades, I've been in original bands, cover bands, and tribute bands. I've been in so many situations that now I feel like I have a keen instinct on how to fix things and what needs to be fixed. And I always enjoyed it whenever I had a group of students who wanted to play on stage. So they'd form these little bands. We had band class. We called it the rock band experience. And a lot of really cool bands came out of that situation. And I love seeing them going from never playing on stage to all of a sudden being up there with the lights on them and sounding really great. So I feel like I might have a knack for helping bands get to the next level. Uh, and so I thought it'd be really fun to do that as a video series. This first band, I don't know who they are. This is just a random band that popped up on that page, but I feel like there are a lot of things I could help them with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play through their set or actually just one song. And I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. It's going to be sort of a commentary. Uh, it's also going to be like what I would do if I was coaching this band. Okay. So this band is covering the song Wait by White Lion. It was a huge hit back in the eighties, I believe late eighties. And uh, it was one of my favorite songs growing up. My sister had the album and I heard it all the time. So I'm very familiar with it. By the way, it took me two hours to blur out all their faces and their backdrop. I didn't want to call them out and, you know, they didn't ask to be judged by me. So I thought it would be the best thing to keep it all anonymous. So let's start from the top and see what happens here. I appreciate y'all being here. If there's anything in particular you want to hear, check it out between songs and let them know. If we know it, we'll play. So for those of you guys that don't know, I just got done uh, going on tour with Songs of White Lion, basically the band White Lion, who did this huge North American tour. So right off the bat, the drummer's talking and he's being very professional. It sounds like he's been in quite a few wedding bands, if I had to guess. But he's just like, you know, thank you for coming. If you have any requests, go ahead and ask the singer. And then what's crazy is the singer comes up and he doesn't even acknowledge what the drummer just said. He just grabs the mic and he's like, by the way, for those of you who don't know... And then he talks about how he supposedly went on tour. And I just thought that was kind of strange how he didn't really acknowledge the drummer at all. And then he launched into this thing saying, for those of you who don't know, and I'm guessing most of us don't know, you know, in his head, he knows. So you might assume everybody else does. But uh, how are we supposed to know this? And I did a little research and I looked up songs of White Lion and it was really weird. I didn't, I didn't see this guy in any of that stuff. I saw that Mike Tramp was singing with them. So I thought, okay, that doesn't add up. So either this guy just like followed the band around on their tour or he was in the crew or something, but I definitely did not see him on stage. I could be wrong, but it just seems a little bit suspicious to me. When I was putting the set list together for this show and I sent the set list to all the band members, this guy right here, the bass player tonight, asked me, he said, how come you don't play the more popular White Lion songs? Like, you know, Wait or when the children cry, you know, the songs that charted and hit the top 10. And I said, you know, that's a good idea. What songs did he want to play in this cover band? You know, you're in a cover band playing at a bar. Were you really going to play a bunch of unknown songs by White Lion? Now, what I'm thinking is happening is the singer wants you to know that he's a huge White Lion fan or something and that he wanted to play the deeper cuts. But because the bass player brought this up, now they have to play, you know, they have to give in and play the hit songs. It just seems like a really strange play to do on stage. And this is the first time I've ever played this song with this band. So, hope you like it. Here it goes. That's a bad move too. I used to do this all the time where you'd make an excuse before you actually started to play. Like, okay, we've only practiced this twice or, you know, this is my first time playing it. It kind of gives you an out. And I try not to do that anymore because it comes off as kind of a weakness. It's kind of giving yourself like an excuse before you start off. Try not to say, I hope you like it, because that comes off as I really, oh, I don't know. I hope you like it. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Instead, if you're about to play a rock song like they're about to, you have to have that rock and roll swagger. You know, you kind of have to think like, we're going to play it. And whether you like it or not, we don't care. We're just going to do it. <laughs> Wait 
Just a moment before our love will die Cause I must know the reason why we say goodbye Wait just a moment and tell me why Okay, so the first red flag is right when he starts off with the guitar. It's this really fuzzy, distorted, piercing kind of sound. It's not very pleasing. You know, even though he's playing a Telecaster-looking guitar, it doesn't sound like one. It just sounds like a rock guitar with a kind of a cheap-sounding amp to me. And I look back there, it looks like he has a couple of crates, maybe a crate half stack, and it just has too much gain on it for a song like this. And what he's doing, it's kind of a singer-songwriter thing where you take a capo, and you don't really play what the song is being played. You just play the chords and you arpeggiate your way through it. And with the distorted tones and everything, it ends up sounding like this. So it's supposed to be this really epic, you know, semi-ballad intro. but it ends up sounding like distorted Zeppelin or like a distorted Southern rock song or something. It just doesn't fit. Up till the third phrase, his voice is doing pretty well. You know what I mean? It's not great, but it's in the right key for his voice. It sounds like he's pretty comfortable. But the third phrase, he goes off key pretty bad right here. Just a moment, tell me why. Even someone without a trained ear would be like, oh, something went really wrong right there. Okay, the band is about to kick in. Let's check out what happens here. So there are those hits in the beginning. It's not the tightest hits in the world that they're doing. It sounds a little bit loose. And like he said, it's their first time playing it through, so that could be expected. But while they're doing the big hits in the beginning, which is supposed to be an epic moment, they're all standing like statues. It's just really strange to see such an exciting part be met with such boring stage presence. And another bummer about the verse guitar part is that he's doing that chord walk down. But if you listen to what's really happening on the real album, it's a really intense guitar riff that sounds more like this. <laughs> Now imagine that being played over the top of this, it would already elevate the song by quite a bit. Okay, let's get to the pre-chorus and see what happens. I guess you're gonna have to wait for the chorus. Sorry. Right when he starts to sing the pre-chorus, he's out of key again. So one of those, you know, train derailments happening again in the song. And it's so bad, like I said, you could tell even if you don't have a train ear that something really bad is happening. He does find his way back a little bit, but he keeps drifting back and forth. So it sounds very unstable. Now listening to his voice, I do hear some promise here and there. Like he'll hit a note and I'll be like, hey, he sounds a lot like the singer from Toad the Wet Sprocket. Something's Actually, as I watched this entire video, I kept thinking he might be better suited in like a 90s alternative type of cover band. Funny thing is, is you can't see the drummer because they're all blurred out, but he looks like the bass player from Toad the Wet Sprocket. So I thought that was a funny coincidence. But let's keep going now into the chorus. That poor drummer is doing all he can do. So he's drumming and he's doing a pretty good job keeping it solid. 
but he's also singing backup vocals. And if you listen to the real song, White Lion have these incredible, huge wall of backing vocals for this song. It's really hard to, you know, emulate that even come close to emulating that with one voice who's doing falsetto. Another thing is that if you listen to the words of the song, wait, it's really about somebody begging somebody not to go, you know, pleading with them. And the way this guy is singing it, it just sounds very uh, kind of flat, almost like he's reading off a cue card. You know, if somebody reads a story to you from a book and they don't change their inflection, they have no emotive qualities, it could seem really boring even if it's a really good story. Well, that's the case with this song. And he's just not selling it with any emotion. So that's the mark of a really great singer, by the way. Listen to the real version. Mike Tramp makes you believe that he actually feels it as he's singing it. And I should mention as well that the bass player is doing a great job too. I just can't hear him very well. I hope it was louder at the venue because through this video, I really can't hear what he's doing until the solo. And, uh, you know, this band could use a lot more low end, a lot more fullness just because the guitar tones aren't doing much for the sound. So we made it all the way to the guitar solo. Let's see what happens. I think we all know that it's the Vito Brada epic legendary solo. But uh, check this out. Guitar! That guy is really good. So this is one of the shining lights of this whole video, and it's really what caught my ear. And I was like, I have to talk about this part for sure. The singer shows a little bit of stage presence, which you could tell he's been on stage. He's not totally, you know, absent when it comes to that department. But he says guitar, which is cool, kind of introducing the guitar solo. Then the guitar player surprised me. He played sort of a Mark Knopfler type solo with some really great phrases. And even though it's not the Vito Brada solo, it's really great for what it is. You know, it seems like he might be improvising a little bit, but he planned a little bit of it out. Uh, it just sounds really great. He has great tone, great feel. So I have no complaints about the solo except for that it's taking the place of a legendary solo, like I said earlier. And I don't blame him. If this guy didn't have much time to practice or he just wasn't up to the task of learning the Vito Brada solo note for note, I understand because I had to learn it once for a collaboration video that I did and it was very difficult. It took me weeks just to get even close to what the real version is. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens now post solo. Here we go. Okay, we're almost to the very end, but you can't see it because I had to blur out his face. But for a large portion of that whole section, he's staring dead into the camera. And it's really unnerving because he's just like kind of looking like this and then he laughs a little bit. Then he looks over here and he kind of, you know, zones in on this part. Then he comes back to the camera. And the reason I bring this up is because if you're on stage and you start to lock your eyes on something for too long, it comes off as robotic and stiff. So you got to be careful of that. Sometimes you're in your head, you're trying to think of what the lyrics are or, you know, you're just thinking of something else besides what you're doing. And what happens is you end up looking like this. It's kind of like deer in the headlights, which is very unprofessional. So if you catch yourself thinking too much on stage or if one of your band members is i don't know throw your pick at them or something just wake them up Oh man, 
there's so much to talk about here. So they're slowing down the end like it's this big epic finish to the concert, almost like they're playing Wembley or something, and they just finished playing a Queen song, and the whole crowd is just going crazy, and they want to just prolong the moment. But in a setting like this, it's kind of embarrassing. It just feels awkward, you know what I mean? And then to add to the awkwardness, he's about to hit the last chord, and he pauses, almost like to build up the tension. And it reminded me a lot of that Friends episode where Ross is playing the synthesizer, and he hits the last note, and he's like, wait. Oh, pardon the pun there. And then he goes, okay, now it's done. <laughs> so it's just this weird, awkward way to finish, especially when really no one seems to be cheering in the crowd right now. And then he hits the last chord, which sounds a little bit, you know, it still has that distorted, arpeggiated sound. And the other guitar player, you know, he points at the singer like, hey, let's give it up for this guy, which is awesome. But then the singer, you know, there's no one cheering. He lifts his arm up at the end and it's just, dead silence from what I can tell. Now, they may have cheered after the clip got done. I'm not sure. But either way, it just felt very cringy in that little section. And for being their first time playing this, instead of having that excitement that sometimes I feel when a band plays a song for the first time, uh, it felt more like nervous, uneasy energy. And that never agrees well with the crowd. You know, the crowd can feel how the band feels. And uh, it's just a whole room full of awkwardness at this point. But like I said before, I feel like there are some shining moments in this band and there is hope. So, you know, if all the suggestions I said were taken into account and maybe they practice for another three months on a song like this, I would love to see them play it again. Also, just playing it a bunch of times and having repetitions is a huge thing. Usually it takes about three times playing a song live before everybody's comfortable enough to really start to vibe on it. So that's one of the things you have to consider. To this band that I used today to start off this video series, uh, all I want to say is that I see a lot of potential and a lot of good things, uh, even though I brought up a lot of negative things that I think could be improved, but that's part of it. So I feel like these guys are either going to be like, oh, that's interesting, or they're going to be like, screw this guy. But either way, uh, it was really fun to critique them playing one of my favorite songs. And I also want to thank everyone for watching this. You know, it's so cool to be able to come up with an idea the next day, create it, and then put it out in the world and people actually watch it. It's a dream come true for me. Okay, everyone, we'll catch you at the next video. Thanks again. Bye-bye.